We're looking at the exhibition called The Tablets by Douglas Bentham of Saskatchewan. This exhibition was organized by the Art Gallery of Swift Current in partnership with the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery. The curators are Jennifer McCrory with the Moose Jaw Gallery and myself, Kim O'Donnell with Art Gallery of Swift Current. To stay out of trouble, I call myself a welder. When I have to admit to uh, being an artist, I usually find some other way. If somebody says, what do you do? I, I usually say I'm in the arts or something like that. Because, I mean, anybody can be an artist. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a visual artist. So it's been my full-time occupation for going on 50 years. Yeah, it's been quite a life. You know, you just want to keep fulfilling this kind of vision out there that you have. and. Uh, it's never fully formed, so you have to keep um, producing and, and applying a discipline to what you do and try to be um, light on your feet is something that I enjoy, you know, enjoy. That's why you see everything in here is, is basically collaged or constructed as opposed to, say, carving or modeling. I, I wouldn't have the patience to carve especially if the arm fell off about, um, if it was figured up about six months into doing this thing and you'd hear some cursing and then I, that'd be it. Doug is a really significant artist in Canada, well recognized for his commission work or his large scale public uh, sculptures that have uh, been placed in a variety of significant locations in larger cities across the country. His work was uh, sought after and when it entered into many collections, Canada Council collections, uh, Saskatchewan Arts Board, other public collections like that. Well, I was, no, I was no prodigy. I came from just a working class household where, you know, there wasn't a lot of emphasis on art. My dad was an automotive mechanic. He was kind of higher up in industrial stuff as a supervisor. It basically introduced me to fabricating, you know, because you know, I did what I could and in the welding department. And, and then I realized uh, after I started into art, I started out in uh, uh, pre-architecture. And at the same time I was um, on the art side, I was taking drawing classes and design classes. I had a decision to make. I could either keep failing physics and, and calculus, or I could draw live models for the rest of my life. So it was a pretty easy decision. I, I went for the models, and that was probably when life started going downhill occupationally, but it was a lot more fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a grandfather figure and a, and a father figure. The grandfather figure was an American sculptor by the name of David Smith, and I patterned myself. He died in 1965. He lived in a similar environment as I do. You know, taught me a lot about working with metal. In a, he was the first to really exploit it. And then my father figure was a British sculpt, sculptor by the name of Anthony Carroll. And uh, he was quite irre irreverent, I'd say, in a sense, to the, uh, to the old traditions. He did work in steel, but he, was, uh, um, he, he wasn't really even a sculptor. He was an engineer. I actually co-led a workshop at the Amalek School in 1977 with him and you know as much as I fought his influences most of my life I, I would still commend him on you know what I learned from him just because of his discipline and I used to have um, a stencil sign in my old shop and it said if you're not working Tony is. A lot of my work is has a kind of an internalized quality to it. It's about putting, creating a pulse or a spirit in a work that that in a lot of cases, like, like the uh, tablet series, feel like they have these kind of mysterious inner parts. The great Frank Stella, who is still alive, one of the original abstract expressionists coined a phrase that says, what you see is what you see, is what he says about his, and his work is so abstract. And so what you see is what you see. Take from it and uh, absorb it and, and experience it for what it is. On the front yard of, of the R.C. Dahl Center, where the Art Gallery is located, we have one of uh, Doug Bentham's early large-scale works. It's called uh, Open Series 4 from 1977, and it was placed here in 1978. And at that time, Doug would have been only 30 years old. 
and uh, already well recognized for what he uh, was, uh, you know, capable of. Opens number four was uh, made within the first seven or eight years of my career. I would suggest at that point I was much more involved or perhaps too, too much involved in creating you know, a vocabulary of sorts, which was really not my own. There was quite a lot of stuff going on in abstract sculpture at that particular time when I was starting. And yet I'm still referred to as one of the first, I guess, it's at least in Canada. So Opens, the Opens piece was um, a conscious effort to create a space of sorts that people uh, could interact with. Uh, I understand on that particular one, even wedding parties use it. It has this frame-like element. And yet when I make them, uh, as I recall making that one, uh, out here in this landscape, I was much more conscious of how the landscape appeared through it. A public sculpture cannot really be called public unless it responds to, you know, the people who are using it and the environment around it. I've really come to embrace that. I have a sculpture at the bottom of the uh, University Bridge in Saskatoon. It's a very large piece called Unfurled. As an artist, I, I don't need another artist to tell me what they think of it or how good it is or how bad it is. I just have to listen to the feedback I get from the public on almost a daily basis and it's, it's just so heartening. And that's over the years which has become a lot more important to me than, you know, the praise from some critic or, you know, some big shot. It goes beyond the individual elements, the parts. It, uh, it, the, when the pieces are brought together into this particular arrangement, that it, it makes another expression. And this is uh, the real kind of exploration and discovery. Even though you think that there's a kind of a sameness or a uniformity to the, the grouping, there is also a real individuality of each uh, element within it. It's my first, you know, what is commonly referred to as an installation. And uh, installation was a new term that came in, oh, probably no more than about 25 years ago that artists started doing these, these large statement pieces that were, you know, using repetitive objects. I want every work to stand alone. I don't want it to be uh, reliant on something next to it or reliant on, on something larger. But um, in the back of my mind, as I started to make these, I, I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could make enough of them that uh, I could create this almost like a forest of them or some sort of sense that that's been the accomplishment for me with them. They all stand as individual pieces and yet they, uh, they combine to create this, big, this large statement. The backs are completely different from the fronts. The way we display them, we encourage people to walk through the display on these different angles and different spaces and then to see how the backs are informed by the fronts but they're completely different. They have their real surprises and that's part of the intent of them. I do a lot of things that have this kind of obviously have fronts and backs just as we do and so a lot of my work kind of in, in a way has figurative connotations rather than being figurative at all and there's lots of architectural references as well. And uh, the tablets started out kind of in the, in the, the spirit of, of other series that I've been working on. One thing that's unique to them, and it doesn't take people long to uh, recognize it, the front sort of facades of the sculptures are full of, bit of letters and small bits of phrases and little short things that are all taken from uh, commemorative plaques, uh, mostly mostly uh, graveside memorials. I always, always remove for good reasons. It's not like I'm, you have to check and see what I'm doing after midnight. <laughs> it's kind of like a history. It's not, I don't want to be morbid and say that they've become, you know, some sort of cemetery objects or, or I don't want to be fatalistic. They're about beauty, uh, as all my work is. It's a beauty quest, that's what I do. Hippocrates said that uh, life is short, art is long. And another quote that I really like is, if you leave art for a day, uh, she leaves you for three. And I think that poets and writers, it's, if you don't do it every day and kind of keep that, that um, momentum and that rhythm, you're gonna be off. You know, it's not like you can't get it back. But um, 
It's, a, it's one of the things that drives me. When you go into art, it just sort of sorts things out after a while. You start living this, uh, this artful life. Everything, you know, refers back to what you're doing. You live and sleep it. And there's two ways that we can go through life. One is the one I've just mentioned, that we, we travel through the world and we record it and then we, you know, we remember certain things and forget we got the pictures and that sort of thing. And the other way is to walk through nature and pretend that you're the camera. Allow your, your, your body to be the camera and that your heart and, and your, your body is a, is a lens, it's a shutter. And then you just open it up and you let nature enter you and imprint herself upon us, upon ourselves. If you have program ideas that you'd like to see on Max TV Local On Demand, write us at max.local at sastel.com.